Welcome to Trade Lounge tonight. We are honored to host probably one of the most, the biggest icons in the world of uh, Tshuva. A rabbi that was here in LA already about 20 times. Only and Bezrat Hashem 20 more at least. Uh, some of you, if you know him on Facebook, he has about 71,000 followers and growing by day from all over the world. Uh, active over 20 years in Kiruv, worldwide traveling all over the United States, in Europe, in, in Israel, all over. Uh, famous debates with the minister that caused many, many, many people from other religions to run super fast to Judaism because they saw the truth. Uh, also, he has a big yeshiva, Tamidei Chachamim, in Yerushalayim. Personally, I have, uh, whoever knows me knows that for the last 10 years in Los Angeles, I was teaching probably in uh, almost every single nightclub in Hollywood. And uh, thanks to this rabbi, today I'm in a different path. I was in the Shiva for about six months, not only me, my brother as well. And uh, we owe him a lot, and it's really a privilege for us. So uh, on behalf of Jay Lounge, Rabbi Louis, HDC, Hebrew Discovery Center, I would like to welcome Rabbi Yosef Mizrahi. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. I actually have been in this place a few years ago. I don't remember exactly how many years ago, but maybe two or three. <laughs> and the topic we chose tonight, it's Path to Happiness. How we can achieve something that every human being in the world is anxious to get. Trillions and trillions of dollars were wasted and millions and millions of different advices by all kinds of people who claim they understand how to reach happiness. And in reality, almost no one is happy. If you speak to 7.5 billion people in the world and you connect them to a light detector, many people can claim they're happy. The question is what the machine will show. <coughs> many, many times I had, uh, I spoke in different places, in private houses, by s some very wealthy people, and uh, I was trying to convince them to move to the direction of keeping Torah and Mitzvot. And then be, the beginning of the, of the arguments, they said, no, I'm very happy the way I am, life is great. But 10 minutes later, he said, can I talk to you in private? <laughs> and then all the truth begins to come out, and actually life is a disaster. Reality, many people already know that, smart people already say that before me, that the world is a stage and everyone is an actor. Some people are better actors than others, some are not as good. But in reality, people are always busy acting, pretending, imitating others. And in reality, how many people can say, my life is perfect, I'm very happy every second of my life, I live the dream, the real dream. Not illusions. Illusions. People who take drugs, they also live in a certain dream for two, three hours until the depression return. So today, we will try to understand what does it mean happiness. If we ask ten different people on the street to define happiness, they may say different answers. One would say to be a millionaire. One would say to be a movie star. One would say to be educated. One say to be happy and have kids. That's all, that's why I'm happiness. Everyone has a different definition for happiness. What does it really mean to be happy? Happiness is that when you close a nice deal in real estate and the check comes to your hand and you're happy for an hour or two, is that happiness? Happiness is when you finally meet a girl and you can get married, is that happiness? Happiness is when you finally have children what does it mean, happiness? Who do you think would be qualified 
to answer this mystery. If we have to ask someone, please explain how, how you define happiness word by word exactly the way the truth <coughs> is. Who do you think will be able to answer this question? Who? The psychologist? They themselves, many of them are unhappy. Psychiatrists? Some of them committed suicide already. So they're not so happy also. The teachers? The doctors? The movie stars? The rock and roll bands? That almost everyone is a drug addict? and they divorce six, seven times, and they don't even know if it's morning or night from their life, and they need their agent to tell them where they are next, because they don't know if, they, if it's Tuesday or Wednesday. Who is really can answer this question, what does it mean, happiness? The answer, only the creator of the world, the creator of people, the creator of life, is the only one that can tell people what happiness is. Now you may come and say, wait a minute. I read the Torah. I heard rabbis that claim what happiness is. And I disagree. I tried. It didn't make me happy. I went to yeshiva a few times. I was boring to me. I come to the shul. I don't find happiness over there. I understand what God said, but I disagree with him. What do you think about someone who says such a thing? He's not lying. He's telling you exactly what he felt. Where is the problem here? Who made a mistake, him or the creator of the world? You may come and say, you can tell me until tomorrow that the creator of the world said something and I feel the opposite. You can tell me that he's right, but I still want to feel, to feel happy for real. And based on what I read over there, I'm not so happy. So what is the point? You can say whatever you want. I'm going to find happiness in my way. The answer is, when I was in the Israeli Air Force, one very important rule for life I learned. A person in life has to know his limitations. We have limitations. Some of us more than others, but we have limitations. We're not perfect. We're not angels. We're not divine. We have a lot of limitations and some defects as well. When you join the Israeli army, when they teach you to fly an F-16 or F-15 or any other plane, one of the most important rules in school to be a pilot is never ever use your own judgment when it contradicts the machine, the Rio, the computer, the screen in front of you when you're up there in heaven, flying left, right, flipping over. Never ever use your judgment. Why? Many times pilots fly above the ocean and basically everything around is blue. Under it's blue, above it's blue. You don't really know if you're looking at the water or you're looking at the sky. And in air combat, the plane sometimes rolls a few times. That's what's called, in a professional language, vertigo. Which means the pilot lose sense. Am I flying straight or am I upside down? The machine always show how the, how the plane is. By the end of the wings, there are two lines to the top or to the bottom. If they're on the top, that means you fly straight. If there are two lines in the bottom, that means you fly upside down. It's very difficult for a person when he's under pressure and it's a matter of two to three seconds between life and death, not to forget that rule. And not once and not twice, pilots in time of problem, they were trying to go up, but they actually went down into the water and died, or into the mountains later. Why? Because they forgot the most important rule. What you think, what the machine thinks, the machine is more precise than you. You can make mistakes, the machine is more perfect than you. Therefore, if you're gonna go with your judgment, you'll be dead. You follow the machine, the machine will save your life, and again, and again, and again, and you can live long life. If the machine 
is more precise than us, imagine the creator of the world. When the creator of the world say A, B, C, D, every answer to every question, that's the right answer. If it match my understanding, <coughs> beautiful. So we are on the same channel. He say that's the right way, and I myself know it's the right way. It's no contradiction. What happened when I read in the divine book, the book of Torah, that was given in public event 3,300 years ago, when I read in a divine book that the creator of the world said, that's the right way to do business, and I disagree, I have to begin to investigate and to check what went wrong in my, in my life. What went wrong in the way I conduct business? When the creator of the world said, this is the way to get married, and I understood that there's a different way to do it, I have to stop eliminate my feelings, acknowledge my limitation, and follow the rules of the creator of the world, which is super perfect. He never made mistake, and he will never make mistake. People who put their ego down, or they acknowledge their ignorance in life, and they surrender to the divine laws, eventually, not immediately, eventually their life is wonderful. People who want to do it their way, like they say in America, my way or the highway, very often pay serious, tremendous price in their life. And I've seen it, 20 years I travel to places, I've seen people from different culture all over the world. It's always like that. The people who are stubborn and always search for the truth and eliminated their own understanding when they saw that the Torah contradict what they know and feel, they in the end always were successful. It may took a long time. One way or the other, you can never go wrong by following the instruction of the one who gave us life. Once before I said, the Torah says, You should do what's straight and decent in the eyes of your God. Why the Torah has to say, You should do what's straight and decent in the eyes of your God? The Torah should have said, And you should do what's right and decent. Why does it have to say, In the eyes of your God? The answer, Hashem already knew that people will make up no good, all kinds of phony, supposedly good, which contradicts what the Torah says. So in order for the followers of the Torah not to fall in this trap, in this phony, fake lifestyles, the Torah had to say, there is good that people invented, and there is only one good, which I define what's good. You want to go by my good? Be my guest. You will never lose. You want to go by the good of other people, other philosophers, other religions? It's your choice. I'm not forcing you. But you should know, eventually, one day you will realize that the choice you made was a huge mistake and there is a price to pay. If there was no price to pay, between you and me, there's no purpose of giving lectures. Why wasting people time? Why wasting the speaker time? Why wasting all the people who run and organize? What for? If there's no price to pay, <coughs> no, bad, no big deal. So you stay what you are. The problem is, when you choose the wrong highway, immediately you lose. You lose gas, you lose time, you are late for your appointment, your customer gets angry, he leaves you, it can cost you millions. There is always consequences. There's not one bad choice in life that doesn't have a price. Sometimes the price is immediate. Sometimes you see the price 30 years later. I'll give you one example of what I'm talking about. A person is 20 years old. They're offering him to go on dates. No, it's time to get married. He begins to go on dates. Now he has two offers. One girl and another girl. Let's call them for the... Argument sake, we'll call them Sarah and Rivka. So he goes with Sarah, and Sarah, she is a very, very righteous girl, very modest, great manners, 
not such a rich family, and not so pretty, average, 50-50. Not ugly, not pretty, average looks. Father is not a multi-millionaire, he's a regular worker, he makes a decent living, nothing more than that. Rivka, on the other hand, very, very pretty girl, comes from a very, very rich family, that their family is also very generous, so they'll give him a house, they'll give him a lot of money, life will be a picnic, he already sees himself driving in a nice car, everything is going to be easy from now on, but there's only one problem, this Rivka of the story, she is not such a righteous girl. She's 50% righteous, 50% not so righteous, which means modesty, very, very shaky. Hirat Shamayim, fear from God, love to God, love to religion, 50-50. Devotion in life, holiness, she never heard of it. She basically has a motto in life, achol v'shato ki machar namut. Eat and drink, because tomorrow we die. Enjoy the moment, don't waste time. So she wants vacation, she runs from one mall to another all the time. You know, she cares about the name of the shoes and the name of the suits and all the jewelry and only she goes to fancy places and, she, and when he says he wants to go down to her, she say, crazy? What is this? It's not, you know, we're not used to this. I'm not, I'm not uh, so happy about it. So, you know, there's two different girls. Now he has a choice to make. He went on one date with her, he went with one date with her, they both want an answer. Most of the people in the world, which one they will choose? The beauty and the money. Most of the people, not all people. Most people will choose the beauty and the money. By the way, it's also the same thing with the men. I'm just giving an example. It can be the other way around. The girl has two men, one not so handsome and not wealthy, but very serious righteous, and the other one exactly as I described before. This choice is not a one-hour choice, and that's it. This is a choice that is going to affect the life of this person for eternity. It will affect him in this life, in his next life. It will affect his children and grandchildren and grand-grandchildren until the end of time. Why? Because if he would choose the very righteous girl, she will support him. She will always be mother. She will not have all millions of friends on Facebook and every day she has a new friend while she's a married woman. She will be down to earth. She will be humble. She will be devoted. She will be a wonderful mother. She will push him to wake up in the morning to go to shul. She will be wonderful. In times of problems, she will cut, she will not spend, she will say, I'm with you, don't worry. She doesn't hide the man, she doesn't put pressure on him, and the marriage is wonderful. Fine, so they're not rich. Fine, she's not the prettiest in the world, but marriage is wonderful. And the kids saw a beautiful, spiritual, devoted mother or father, and it, it goes on and on and on. It's affecting the entire genealogy of this family. In few generations later, there's big rabbis and holy people and people who affect the whole world and brings lots of pleasure to the creator of the world thanks to a choice that this man or this woman made in one hour of their life. It's going to determine how your entire future would be. Just like the GPS. When you have a GPS and it tells you exit three, and you're busy with something, and you miss the exit, and it's on the four or five. So now next exit is an hour now, rush hour. <laughs> Someone just told me today why it's called four or five, because you drive there four or five miles per hour. <laughs> that was a good one. I once drove 5 a.m. to the airport, to LAX, 5 a.m. bumper to bumper. And I thought, why, this time, it's easy. Baruch Hashem. So, in a GPS, one mistake has a chain reaction. Now until you get to the next exit, and then until you, get, you make a U-turn, and go back another half an hour until you get to the exit, and until you get to the office, and your boss is already fuming, and he begins to scream, and now, you know, all, one thing leads to another, the next thing you're unemployed, and it's affect your marriage, and it's affect your children, and it's affect your entire life, by missing one exit. Same thing in the GPS. 
As soon as you miss the exit, what happened to all the future roads? Not one of them stayed the same. Everything is changing. One transaction in a person's life affects millions and millions of other paths that were open to him. Everything changed. And that's why life is not a picnic like most people think. Most of the people, they think they came to the world to be successful here. If they only knew that this world, the Torah say that it's a blink of the eye. How many times a person blink per minute? Six, seven times. Anyone ever counted that he blinks six, seven times per minute? Every seven, eight seconds he blink. Anybody cares? You don't even realize you're blinking. Why? It's windshield wipers. Also, it gives the muscle a minute of a second of rest. The muscle needs to rest from time to time. So it's a system. Seven, the eight, the years. Every few seconds it blinks, it cleans the dust, it's working, and nobody ever paid attention that his eyes go on and off, on and off, non-stop. Why? It's so short, it's not worth to waste a second to think about it. The Torah compared the life here in this world to a blink of the eye. Ha'olam hazeh ke'eref ha'in. This world, it's over. 70, 80 years before you realize it will be over. What is it like? A person wants to drive to be a limo driver. Limo driver. They promise him $2,000 a week salary. You know. So he's thinking, let me go get a test, be a driver, and I'll get my license and I'll be a driver. So they take him to a car, no air condition, very humid, the chair is broken, no stereo system. The wheel today is very, very hard. And he sits there, the test is five minutes. And all he does is complaining. I can't believe it, why there's no condition? Why there's no sunroof? Why the mirror doesn't move automatically? Where is the music? What's going on? Is this person is normal? Or a normal person say, ah, five minutes, what's the point of complaining? Let's get it over and finish. No one would focus on the five minutes. Everyone would care about the 40, 50 years that he drives the limo and make millions. No one would care about the five minutes. But in this world, it's the other way around. Everyone care only about the five minutes and nothing about what's going to be later. And as a result of that, we lose from both ways. Both ways we lose. We lose that when we're supposed to go to the life of eternity that the Torah promised, to the followers of God, we may lose it, which is a horrible price to pay. And at the same time, we may think, okay, at least I had this world. At least I got something. But in reality, you do not find one person who is happy. <laughs> so in, basically, what's going on here? No world to come and no this world also? Losing from both sides doesn't make sense. At least you give up something big, you get something small, you say, well, at least I got something. But if most people here are depressed, someone asked me a few, a few years ago when the real estate crashed, what's, what's to do now? Real estate is bad, retail is bad, diamonds is bad. I don't know what to invest, where to invest. So I told him, invest in anti-depression medicine. <laughs> so he said to me, what? I said, yes, buy all the anti-depression stocks. He said to me, why? I say in America, the mentality of the people in such a materialistic country, America, Europe, Israel, same thing. It's addiction to materialistic lifestyle. That's all what people have in this world. How comfortable my car, how wonderful is my house, jewelry and clothing and name and reputation and, you know. Therefore, when you take it away from the people, means now they cannot pay the mortgage, everything is collapsing, big problems, people going crazy. So they become very depressed. When they go to the psychologist, what's the first thing he says? Prozac. Prozac or psychiatrist. So everyone will buy medicine because they cannot go on with the pain of losing their money and comfortable lifestyle. And that's exactly what happened. They doubled in a short period of time. And this person made a lot of money. Why? You don't need to be a genius. That's the way it is. People make money, they think they're happy. 
you take away their job, immediately they become depressed, they're not in the mood, they don't want to go to weddings, they don't want to eat, or they gain weight, everyone reacts different to depression. And that's what's happening. Let's make, let's make an order in defining, defining what happiness is. Let's try to understand one thing. First, we have a rule. What's the rule? A person needs a mission in life, a target, a destination. <clears throat> if a person is busy achieving something, even if this something is fake, it's all illusion, but he thinks that he has a dream, he has energy to live. I give you an example of what I mean. The Steitler, the father of Rav Chaim Kanievsky, was the greatest rabbi in the world in the previous generation. There was a depressed guy in yeshiva. He cannot wake up in the morning, he cannot come to learn, he's sleeping in bed, depressed. He had some kind of a crisis, and he cannot function anymore. They assigned a psychologist to help him, and uh, the psychologist, the, he couldn't help, he just couldn't, he didn't know what to do with him. He tried everything, it doesn't work. As the last option, he brought him to the stipler. The stipler started to talk to him. Ten minutes, the person came out of the room like a brand new baby. And no person, no Prozac, no nothing. Very happy. Ah, ah, came back to life. Next day gets up in the morning, comes to shul, praying, learning, mamash, like born again. This psychologist, which is a famous psychologist, ran quickly to the stipler. He said, what did you do that I couldn't do? I'm a psychologist for 30 years. What did you do? I have to find out. He told him, I realized that this person has no reason to live. He has no goals. If a person has no goals, life is very boring and very depressing. So I told him, I want you to write a book about this subject. Start learning, collect information, write a book, and then you and I will go over your book. And me, as a famous rabbi all over the world, I will write you a beautiful letter, in the beginning you print it on a book, that you and I together went over the material, and I'm giving you my confirmation and approval. And as soon as he heard that, all of a sudden he had a reason to live. One advice changed his entire life. This is an example how a person is looking, <laughs> a person, all the other people, prepare your phone for the next time that it doesn't happen again. First time it happens, fine. Second time, I already should have thought of it. So the a person is looking for meaning. That's one, one issue. Second issue, second issue, most of the people have constant problem, meaning they live in a constant doubt. They have doubts in their life what to learn, what to do in college, which school to go after college, which job to choose, who to get married to, all kinds of things. So a person always has doubts in his life. What's the problem? When a person lives in a doubt, it's very difficult for him to have satisfaction and happiness. The Gemara say, en simcha ke atarat asfekot. Let me give you an example. A person is in real estate. He is putting a deal together and he's hoping to close the deal and it's $20,000 commission for him, which can help him financially a lot. The problem is that the deal is going on and on and on, like sometimes there's no end to it. And next week, next week, next week, next week. Eventually he gets to the point that the doubt killed him so much so you say, you know what, let me call this customer, I don't care if I blow the deal off, whatever. Yes, yes, no, no, but give me an answer right now. And he calls him and he puts some pressure on him and the customer gets angry and he says, you know what, if you're so arrogant, I don't want anything to do with you. No deal, goodbye. You may think that this person will feel bad, but you'll be surprised. There will be a relief for him. You know what, I lost the deal, but at least it's not going to kill my mind anymore. When a mind of a person is constantly occupied in a doubt, he has no rest. One more problem, 
one more problem. People in their life are busy in competition with others. People are in competition with family, with friends, with people around. They live in a constant competition. Who's going to be more successful? Who's going to have a nicer house? Who's going to buy a nicer car? Whose wedding going to be fancier for his children? And constantly the people live in pressure that it's completely unnecessary. Who does it impress? The people that come to your wedding a week later, nobody even remember he came there. Nobody remember how delicious was the food and you spent a hundred thousand dollars on flowers and you brought three Persian bands. You think anyone would remember it? Tomorrow morning, people back with their misery and running after money and fame and glory and nobody remember. Even the Khatan and Kala would watch their album once and that's it. And it goes to the archive and collect dust. That's what it is. This whole show of an aggravation and fights before the wedding and all these things that people have only come from one reason. What is it? What's the reason? Not knowing what I'm doing in this world, living in a, in a constant light, not realizing, is this what my creator expects from me? Show off, competition, to show that I'm the best, to show that I have the nicest uh, taste, what is this? Where is it going to get me? Besides aggravation and money waste, it's never going to help me. One time I was invited to speak in a very big organization that helps kids that have cancer, lo alenu. They help the family from A to Z. It's not only money, even rich people that can pay all the bills, they still need advice where to go, where to start, what is the next step. They need a lot of support, mental support. Not everything is money. Money is an issue here. But besides that, there's so many other things involved. When I saw how much this organization does for the parents, for the first time I realized what these parents are going through. So they invited me, they did a, once a year they do funds raising on the radio, live studio, and you know, I was interviewed there for about 20 minutes or more. And this is what I said. I said over there, people here in New York spending half a million dollars on a wedding, sometimes even a million, and there are kids laying in a hospital Imagine if a person that is about to do a million dollar wedding to his daughter or his son, if somebody comes to him and say, I have an offer that you can replace this wedding by a normal wedding, nothing major fancy, okay, not, not a shame, but okay, nothing extraordinary like you're planning, but with the $900,000 that you're gonna save on the show off of this wedding, you're gonna be able to take 100 kids out of the hospitals that connects to machine by giving it to them and you give them life instead of them dying, you took them out of the bed and they revive, you revive them and one day they have families and children and after you finish your life here before you die, you see a video. You took 100 kids out of the hospital and now there are 1,000 healthy people that they have businesses and families and some of them are rabbis and doctors and all kinds of things and they show you no, which one you prefer, a two hour show of wedding or saving these thousand souls. Do you know one person in the world that wouldn't say of course this? But in reality if you come to the people before they make the fancy wedding, they won't agree to give it up. You tell them cancel this fancy wedding, take the 900,000, let's give it to save souls Let's save Jews from intermarriage. They're going to be disappeared from the Jewish nation. They're about to marry someone and that's it. They get wiped out from the Jewish nation for eternity. Imagine all their grandparents, all the holy people from the past that now after <coughs> hundreds of hundreds of years of holy rabbis, all of a sudden they have a grandson that's about to marry Christine and become Christian and his kids are non-Jewish and the family gets cut off. And you can save it by a few dollars. For some reason, even though people agree that it's an intermarriage and assimilation, it's a big problem for the Jewish nation, for some reason, almost no one would agree to cancel his phony and foolish plans in order for him to do the right thing. So we see 
that even if the mind understands, the heart does not let go of these foolish desires for one minute. In psychology, it's called cognitive dissonance. The brain gets it in one hour, it takes seven years for the heart to digest. When Albert Einstein came with his discoveries, all the scientists in the world went on all his results, checked them, and came to the same results. And all of them refused to agree with him for seven years, until one of them said, hey, how long we will deny it? We don't have anything to contradict him. And the world slowly, slowly started to adjust his discovery. One more thing we have to understand. A person that lives with faith, his life is much more solid, much more peaceful than someone that lives without faith. Now, before you jump, I didn't say faith in Judaism. I say any kind of faith. Even a non-Jew that believes in his idol and he thinks this is his God, or Christians who believe in JC and that's their God, or Muslims who follow Muhammad and that's their Navi. Everyone with this belief or false belief, whatever you want to call it, the fact that a person has someone that he relies on takes a lot of the pressure from his life and they made many, many surveys here in America. Religious people recover from sicknesses in a much higher percentage rate than non-religious. And again, I didn't say Jewish religious. I say everyone who has faith in something divine, automatically his life is better. So all of a sudden we see something here, that a person in order for him to have relief in his life, has to rely on something greater than him. Just let me give you an example. If a person is trying to make it financially on his own, you have to agree with me, and it's not the same if his father is very poor or his father is very, very rich. Someone that his father is very, very rich, he always have in the back of his mind the understanding that if I'll fail, I have who to go, and his father is a very generous man, he's going to write him a million dollar check. No big deal. So he has confidence in someone. Someone that his father doesn't have what to eat, you know, if I'm not making it, I'm on the street. The pressure, the tension, cause him to make mistakes. It's needless to say, when a person believes in the creator of the world and he follows the Torah, and he reads in the Torah that the Torah promised something very interesting. There is a rule in Judaism that Hashem taught us when he gave us the Torah. The more you rely on me, for real, not in beautiful speeches, the more you rely on me and you count on me to help you, the more I will help you. The more you rely on yourself or on other people like you, the less I will help you. Therefore, if a person learns Torah and has knowledge and faith in the creator of the world, it makes his life a lot easier. Why? Because the confidence is incredible. Confidence, it's not just another advice, it's the foundation of life. I will clarify it soon. One more problem is, one more problem, it says like this, Pikudei Hashem, Gesharim Mesamchei Lev. The orders of God are honest and straight. They make the heart happy. When a person is involved with the Torah, what is it like? The Torah says that Hashem said to the Jewish people when he gave them the Torah, I created the evil inclination. The evil inclination is an angel. It's called the Satan. He's in charge of all the, there's two kinds of evil inclination. There is a natural evil inclination that you're born with. Every one of us born with that. And it's different between one person to another. And there is an external evil inclination. And together they work as a team. They work as a team. Let me give you an example. If a person is born stingy, is in, in his previous life, he died very stingy. He doesn't like to share with anyone, only for himself, very selfish. One day he dies, he stands on a trial in front of God, 
he judged his entire life and he said, hey, I'm going to give you another chance to be reincarnated and go back to world. To world. <coughs> Whatever you corrected in your previous life, you don't have to bother with. You're done. This desire will not move on to the next life with you. It's out of your file. Whatever you did not fix, you will be born with the same desire. So if you were a person that learns a lot of Torah, you love Torah, when you're reborn, you still have desire for Torah. Hashem did not take it away from you. If you're a modest person with the ladies, you have discipline, you're not living like a, I don't want to say what. So you, you have control on your life and you died. When you're born, you already have natural holy instinct in you. Sometimes we even see it by secular people. They're not religious, but they're very faithful. They, you know, they're decent people when it comes to this. You know, they get married, they're family, they're good parents. And they have a very nice life. And sometimes even a person that calls himself religious is way off. And his desire destroys him. So we see, whatever weakness you die with, you return with the same weakness. If you fixed it, you are done with that. That's why you take three little children, you give each one of them a bag of pretzels. Two years old, each one of them. Triplets from the same parents. Same face, triplets. You give the, the first one a bag of pretzels, and the second and the third. And you ask him, give me one. And he gives you one with a sour face. Give me another one. Already gets angry. By the third one, he explodes. <laughs> Three hours. <laughs> he he choked. Moshe, do something. No way to relax him. You ask for too much, you got on his nerve. The second one. Give me one, even one he doesn't want to give you. Just give him a huge bag. Give me one. No! You'll take one, World War III. <laughs> and you come to the third one, give me one. He gives you one. Give me another one. Take another one. Give me another one. Here's another one. Give me another one. He take two, three for himself. He gives you the whole bag. <laughs> this is reality. You cannot deny it. Three triplets, same face. Same parents, born within minutes from each other, same sign on a horoscope. <laughs> one very stingy, one very generous, one 50-50. Both. How, who told these children to be like this? They never learn about generosity or being stingy. How do they know? Maybe I have a million bags of pretzels for them. Maybe there is unlimited amount of pretzel bags. No one ever told them to save. Why are they so worried by giving? Where did they get this desire to be stingy from? The answer, that's how they died. The one that died stingy came back to the world with the same desire. The one who died generous, he gives all the time to poor people, to rabbis, to yeshivot. He was born with the same traits. If a person died full of ego, He's born full of ego. That's why you see sometimes little kids, all day they try to attract attention, all the time. And then you see kids, let them be in a corner, you give them attention, no, they're happy. Why? That's how they die. Sometimes you see, people want attention no matter what. Some people, with, without attention, they're happy. So we see, we have a rule here. The more bad traits the person has, the more miserable his life is. For instance, let me give you an example. Person that has anger has no life. Nobody can be more miserable than three kinds of people. One, proud people all the time show off and if, not, if you don't give them enough honor and respect, it's a dead sentence for them. Let's see you dare to make them sit with their back to the band in a wedding. You'll see what's gonna be with you. <laughs> Rivka, get up. Erase the check. Take a zero off. <laughs> this nerve this guy has, he puts me here in the corner, he makes a big show. He cannot just be quiet and say, well, Hashem, I have a test in life. Let's see how I deal with that. No. Right away, big balagan, mess. Why? I'm here. Some people, as soon as they walk into the room, they're very loud with their behavior. 
they don't even realize it. It comes from the subconscious, because we have conscious and subconscious. By the way people dress, by the way their makeup is, by the way the hair is, I can tell you anything you want about them. Write you a report. You don't need a private investigator. You come to me, you show me the person, I tell you everything about it. Not because of me, because the Torah already say how a person walk. I have a lectures about body language. How a person walk, like this. What is it? 20 years in a gym, for the one hour a month, he walks on Venice Beach, like this. You know, put cream, shave his hair, like this. Gorilla. <laughs> When people talk and they put their mouth on their, and they put their hands on their mouth. <laughs> you know this kind of people? Move your hand already. What? <laughs> That's a subconscious issue. I wish I don't have to talk. He, he, he has no choice. You ask him a question, he has to answer, but without realizing he put his hand, he show you that he's dying from the situation. I wish I didn't have to answer. The movements, the way you talk, the way you walk, the way you dress, the way you move your hands, the way your legs are, you know everything about the person, everything, from A to Z. Generous, angry, proud, humble, sharing, egoistic. I can tell you, every person in the audience, if you like the lecture, or he suffers. How? That's why I change a lot of subjects in the middle. If I see too many people move to the edge of the table and holding their, their knees, which means they don't realize they're ready to get up already. But they don't realize. They so, say, well, when this, this torture will end? But if I see a person leg on leg like this, like this, relax, happy, say, oh, go all night. I'm happy. So you see, people don't realize, but you know everything about the way they are, you know everything about what they think, which is very interesting. So, a person that has anger, his life is no life. All, every little thing is fuming with his wife, with his children. The Gemara says, someone that is angry, even the people of his home cannot stand it. They shake from him. Everything, it's a show, next to him. As soon as he goes, ah, Baruch Hashem. <laughs> we have a few days to rest now. So, uh, if sometimes you see people that have kids that looks very, very polite and have great manners. Don't be so impressed. That's not a sign that they're polite and have manners. They are shaking from their father, he's around. It's robots, it's trained soldiers. Soldiers behave next to the commander in the army the way he wants them to. <coughs> Otherwise, they'll be in jail. Or he keeps them Shabbat in a base. That's not someone who worked on his character and improved it. That's a trained soldier, like a trained dog. He's afraid of his owner. And as soon as he sees him, he behaves accordingly. But when he goes away, you know, he feels comfortable. That's not a sign of manners. One more thing, jealousy. Jealousy. There are three kinds of jealous people. People who are jealous with people that achieve spiritual thing, it's a fantastic thing. You're jealous with big rabbis, maybe one day you'll be one. You're jealous with holy people, maybe one day you'll be one. You're jealous with generous people, maybe one day you'll be one. So you're jealous with someone that has great personality in a spiritual way, it's very good. That's a very positive competition which the Torah allows and promotes and endorses. However, there are two other kinds of jealousy. There is a jealousy that a person sees that someone else has something, and right away he say, why I don't have the same? And he begins to suffer. Why he has such a car and I have such a lousy car? Why God? Why? Why? It's not fair. Why are you not honest? Why you give one so much and, and you give me nothing? I don't want you to take from him. Let him have. Uh, my eyes is not on what he has. I'm just asking why I don't have. The answer, this is a jealous person, but not the worst one. 
there is one kind that is worse. He has everything, but when he sees someone that has a lot less, it still bothers him. That's called Tsar Ein. He can't see anybody that has something. Even if he has, he can't see. Let's give another example. The Torah says, Pat ba melach tochal, you should be ready to eat bread with salt. Ma'im ba meshorat ishte, order, simple, very simple water, you're ready to drink. Vechaye tsar tichye, and life, life of trouble you live. Ashrecha ba olam hazeh, וטוב לך בעולם הבא. How lucky you are in this world and great for you for the afterlife. I have to clarify one thing here. If a person lives simple life here and he doesn't have desires and whatever God gives him, he always say thank you and he's very grateful and he never steal from anyone and he's not jealous with anyone and he never gets upset or angry and anything like that, there's no more chairs for all the people in the back. No more chairs here? Come on. I'm sorry, they have to stand over there. There's no more chairs. No. <coughs> so, if a person live very simple life, eventually he would pay off for the afterlife. He will pay off for the afterlife. But why Ashrecha Ba'olam Azeh? There are a few chairs right here, three here and two here. Maybe from the back you can come see. The question that I have is, for the afterlife, we understand that it's good. But why it's good for this world? Why? If a person has nothing special in this life, why it's so good? For the afterlife, I understand. I live simple life. One day, you know, I'm gonna get reward for being humbled and happy with what Hashem gave me. But why life is better here? The answer is, let me explain. We have a rule. Ke godel atzipiot, kach godel achzavot. Translation. The more expectations you develop in life, the more disappointments you have. If you develop high expectations in anything you do, when you do not achieve your expectation, what happens to you right away? It breaks your heart, you become depressed, you said you have no satisfaction, and sometimes you give up the future, and you're not even trying anymore because you fail a few times, and that's it. What's the solution? Don't develop any expectation. Whatever comes is for your own good. Now I'm going to read you the words of one of the greatest rabbi in the last hundred years in the world. The words of the Chazonish. This is what he wrote. Listen to this. Huh? Yeah, I said, there's more chairs here in the front. You can come from the end. Make them come inside, there's chairs here. Adam, Adam, if a person, Ubal Nefesh, Ush Atosh Ata Sheket, translation, if a person has a soul, and his moments right now in his life is a peaceful moment. Free from hunger and desires. As roe et aolam be'inayim be'irot. Translation. If a person has moment of peace of mind, that he's able right now to clear himself from hunger and, and physical desire. 
Once he get to this moment, he begin to see the world in clear eyes. Let me explain to you what I mean. A guy meet a girl in the bar. Not religious, obviously. <laughs> well, today, today everyone is religious. Everyone. <laughs> I'm, I'm religious. So, but, so it says like this. A guy meet a girl in a bar. He comes, hi, if she likes him. Hi. <laughs> Five minutes of talk. I have to run to the bathroom. She fixed the makeup, everything. Beautiful, very good. She comes back, makeup again, all night, on and off, on and off. Baruch Hashem, it paid off. Boyfriend and girlfriend, Baruch Hashem. Two weeks later, he told her he loves her, so she takes all her friends. She's in a, in a dream. She makes mistakes in the stocks for the clients. <laughs> they are losing. <laughs> What's going on? He told you to send. He bought. Her mind is somewhere else. Let them fire me. I don't care. She see butterflies. He's Michlal, driving instead of driving where he's supposed to go. He drives to the other side. <laughs> Baruch Hashem, they bought in a dream. They are boyfriend and girlfriend for a few good years. Listen, this is what I'm telling you. Don't challenge it because it's from experience of 20 years. Every week, every week. It's in the Torah. But I have two sources, the Torah and life. And they say, en chacham kebal nisayon. You have experience, you can argue with experience. Boyfriend and girlfriend. Like they say in Israel, zug, zug, zug yonim. I don't know why, the doves, but they nice together, okay. Zug yonim. Few years they even move together, they live together, they make all the sins possible in the Torah. And one day, in the middle of a football game, an airplane passed by. Sherry, would you marry me? 70,000 people, Baruch Hashem, on television, she's in the moon. Baruch Hashem. Getting married, three months later, Rabbi, I want to get the rules. Seven years they live together, everything Baruch Hashem. Now they got married, right away, they want to get divorced. So the rabbi opened the file in a rabbi mood, and they asked the girl, why do you want to get divorced? This is every week, every week, mainly in Israel, but here probably the same. He's horrible, what? Very angry, have no patience for me, doesn't give me attention. That's one reason. Second, he smells, he's not clean, he messes up the house, he doesn't appreciate anything. Ba, 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 ba. She gives a whole list. Then the rabbi said to her, I, I, one thing I'm not getting here. If you met yesterday in a shiduch, like two Hasidish boys and girls, fine. He didn't know these things. But you live seven years together, all day, all day like this. Seven years! All of a sudden, shh, two enemies. Police, 911, Mama, help me out. Can you release me on bed? What are you doing in jail? She called and she said, I hit her, I wasn't even home. <laughs> you know what's going on out there. So the question is, we're not dealing with fools here. They know each other for seven years, Ara, come on. What happened? The answer is, the Torah says something very scary. Mm. Something forbidden, the person has strong desire for it, and when he gets it, it's very sweet in his mouth. Because it's forbidden, it's much sweeter. Which means, if you buy a bottle of water for two dollars, you enjoy it. You took it and put it in your pocket and left, and then you drink it. Ah, there's no explanation. There is something that called Yetzer Ara, the evil inclination. They made a survey. They put guys to a bar with two identical twins. 
two girls look exactly the same. You can't even tell the difference. I think their mother wouldn't know. Let's have exactly the same clothes, same everything. They say to them, this one is married, this one is single. Logically, person that is decent and wants to do the right thing, who should he go to talk to? Single. To the single. More than 70% went to speak to the married, when they have an available one, identical, and the rest admitted that they wanted to speak to the other one, but they're married, because after all, she's a married woman. Why they had more desires to the married one when they have the exact same product right next to it? Same thing on the shelf. Same exact thing, nothing different. The answer, the Satan is an angel. He has a job. God put him in this world to make us commit as many sins as possible. If we overcome the test, we get a huge reward in life of eternity. If we fail, we pay the price. Life is not a picnic. This is what the Torah says. Re'e anochi noten lifnechem ayom tachayim ve'et ha'tov et ha'mavet ve'et ha'ra uvacharta b'chayim. I'm giving you the life and the good, the dead and the bad, and you should choose the life. Meaning you can choose the bad. I'm not interfering with your choices. Who gives a person the strength to drive the car on Shabbat? which is totally against the laws of the Torah. The same God. Who gives a person the strength to steal and not get in court and fool the police and fool the camera? Who gives it to him? Same God. Who gives the person the strength to hit people? Same God. Who gives the person the strength to do, do all kinds of horrible other things? Same God. <laughs> same God who gives the strength to a person who wants to come to yeshiva to learn Torah or to come to pray or to help the poor. Same God give the strength to the wicked people to make all the crimes against him. How can it be? The answer, A person chooses first which path he wants to enter. That's the purpose of life. This is where I told you that you should go. You can go anywhere you want. I'm not holding you. You enter your way, you are responsible to what's going to happen eventually. You listen to me, you're going to get the reward that I promise. I do not interfere with your choices at all. One more thing the Chazoni says, Im izke adam largish et ara ve'animas be'eder yediyat ha-Torah. If a person will have the merit to feel the horrible and the despicable feelings of not knowing the divine Torah of God, 99.9999% of the people in the world don't have any idea what the Torah is. They never learn one day in their life to feel the sweet sweetness of the Torah, to feel the effect that it has on the soul, on the impact of the life. They never taste from it. Many people criticize the Torah because they're afraid so much to be religious, thinking it's the most horrible thing in life, and reality is the other way around. Because the creator of the world say, Ta'amu pur'u ki tov Hashem. You cannot think and understand that I'm great and my ways are great until you're not entering and taste from it. Now you may come and say, wait a minute, you telling me that if I become Shomer Shabbat, I'm gonna enjoy keeping Shabbat, meaning I have to close my business, I cannot drive to my friends. How can I enjoy it? The answer, there is a rule in life. Most people think when you offer them something, if I like it, I buy it. If I don't like it, I'm not interested. Leave me alone. Not interested. Don't tell me, I'm not interested. That's a very big mistake. Why? The Torah said the opposite. Look again, remember what I said before? <coughs> the pilot, computer say one thing, your mind say the opposite. Try to understand what God say. Don't put an X on it before you even taste and try. This is what he said. Acharei ha'peulot nimshachim ha'levavot. 
after the actions, the hearts will adjust, will be attracted to it. No matter what you're going to force yourself to do in life, whether it's true, whether it's false, after you do it more and more and more, you will fall in love with that. They ask one man that had three wives and many kids, and then he was sent to jail for almost 20 years. And in, in, a, in a jail, he became gay. And when he came out of the jail, he didn't want to go back to women. So they told him, we understand that you were in jail, you were forced to do all kinds of other scenes because you didn't have other options. But how now when you're free, you don't want to go to your original desire and you stay with the way you became? So he said, I got used to it. I don't want to go back to the old ways. Even though it's against the law of nature, to some of us it looks very despicable, but he got used to the new way. This is the way Hashem designed the human being. You want to do it, you don't like it right now, begin to do it. One, two, three. Every time you will suffer a little less. I remember when I was in the army, I was in a place that you have to sleep with the uniform and the shoes two days in a row. You can't take shower, you cannot sleep, you can sleep, but you have a siren right above your bed you must be with the shoes. You cannot take your shoes. Why? If an airplane enters Israel, Israel is the size of <laughs> maybe Pico in the valley. and uh, <laughs> very small. In less than three minutes, the plane can go from the north to the south in air combat. So as soon as they come near the border, in less than a minute, the planes have to be on the air. It, mamash, you have to see how it's done. The pilots come with the jeep, puts the helmet, everyone runs, they put the pins out, you're under the ground. The plane comes out, all the winds come in your face. In less than 60 seconds, it has to be on the way. One, half a minute late, Israel is finished. This is Marash Melo, you must be on alert all the time. And all the time there are trainings. So I was there, and we are not allowed to go to the kitchen of the base. The rest of the soldiers, you know, they, they have regular life. They go to sleep every day. They take the shoes or whatever. But we on alert. So we cannot leave that place for a minute. Which means the fortune of the country is in our hands. There are a few bases like this. That's one in the north, one in the south, one in the center. Everyone is assigned to a different border. So what happened now? So I used to hate eggplants like you can't believe it. I remember when my mother used to put them on a the fire. It looks like boobies. <laughs> Just look at that, I almost vomit. I said, come, come, taste, tell me if it's good. Eh? I want to vomit. Just to see it, how it's burned like this. Please, please, please. Now I'm in the army. There's nothing to eat. So they give you dog meat. Not hot dog, real dogs. It's called Luf. Who is Israeli here? Do you know anything worse than Luf in the whole world? Did you ever see anything worse than that? Imagine beef meat or whatever, six months in a can. Just you open it, a funeral for a dog. That's how it smells. That's what you can eat. Bread, potatoes, plenty of eggplants. <laughs> they decided to start with me. Every day, what's today? Eggplants. There's one guy from Haifa, Ofer. He knew how to cook. We have to cook ourselves. Can I go to the kitchen? Every day, slice eggplant, make this, nothing to eat. So I went like this. That's how I was eating. <coughs> One of them, I have to eat some loof, between loof and the eggplant, nightmare. Today, not one Shabbat in my house, at least eight different salads with eggplants. Eventually, the pain went away, later I started to like it, and today is my most favorite food. <laughs> this is the answer to all the critics who think that if they're gonna stop keeping the laws of God, it's gonna be, be there. It's not gonna be fun, don't worry. Maybe three months, that's it. After three months, the evil inclination surrender, you begin to see the light of God, your soul begin to revive and feel wonderful, you have satisfaction, it's affect you. 
the Torah, the Hashem said, I, Ani barati yetzer ara, I created the evil inclination, and I created the medicine against it. What is it? The Torah. What is it like? If a person has an infection in his body, and he begins to take antibiotics, the antibiotic reduces the infection. Well, what happens if you stop after a day? You took four or five times, you stop the antibiotic, the infections begin to grow. You begin to take again, it reduces. You stop, it grows. That's exactly how the Torah is. Look at the people, when they learn Torah, how much less sins they do, the days that they learn. As soon as they go on vacation from the yeshiva, they come back to their parents, to the area, friends again, the street, 80% reduction in their spiritual level. What, if you don't believe me, go and check. Go to all the buildings in Los Angeles that the people that pray over there also learn Torah in the same place, like Kolev, Yeshiva, teenagers, you know, high school, when they learn now for two, three hours, and now they come to pray, and go to buildings that people come from work, from the streets, from everywhere, they come for half an hour to pray, and you see the difference on the prayers. When they learn Torah, everyone is in a different world, no one is moving, everyone wears jackets, hats, they pray much, much longer, no one is in a rush, no one touch the phone, no one text in the middle, everyone focus. You come to other places, the mind of a person knows when this nightmare will be over already. Why? When you don't learn Torah, the evil inclination eats you from inside. You'll never be happy. You will never be satisfied in one thing you do in your life. It's always going to be anger and jealousy and stinginess and laziness and all kinds of other things. Now one minute you'll be free from this poison, spiritual poison that eats the person from inside. So Hashem say, Im ta'azveni yom, yomai me'ezveka. If you leave me for one day, you will feel my absence in your life right away for two days. David HaMelech wrote in Tehilim, Alamda poshim drachecha vechotim elecha yashuvu. I will teach the sinners your ways, and those who violate your rules will return to you. That's his purpose in life. What does he want to do? I want to help everyone who lives in a dream to return to you to see your sweetness. Tov li torat picha me'alfei zahav kesef. I am the king of Israel, the king of the world. Everyone bow down to me. I'm the general of the army. We are the strongest nation in the world in this time, 3,000 years ago, and I'm begging you. Please let me go to the yeshiva and learn Gemara and Torah over there. I just came from Shabbaton with the Valley Torah yeshiva. And, you know, beautiful teenager from 9 to 12 grades. This is the future of the Jewish nation. With all the challenges that we have today, YouTube, Internet, Facebook, all kinds of things on the street. Without Torah, our nation has no future. The intermarriage in America getting to more than 70%. It's crazy what's going on. When I started to give lecture 20 years ago, it was 52%. That was the statistic. Seven out of 10 Mary goyim and disappeared from the Jewish nation. The Jewish nation started 4,200 years ago after the flood of Noah with the same generation like the Chinese people. Shem, our grandfather, was the uncle of the Chinese. Vayole de Tassini, the Sini from Ham, Shem is his uncle. We started in the same generation. The Chinese are close to two billion with restriction on birth. And we, the Jews, never had restriction on birth. In China, you can give birth to only one kid, not allow more. We never had restriction. How is it that we are only 13.2 million in the world? The answer, assimilation, intermarriage, and one more reason. 
we did not listen to our God, to our Father, and we pay a tremendous price. Today, we live in a generation you're not allowed to say the word punishment. As soon as the speaker say, the Torah say, that the wicked people will receive this punishment, people begin to crucify him. Everyone wants to be politically correct, everyone wants to be popular, no one wants to have enemies, and everyone forgot about the main instruction of Hashem, that speaker must present the Torah to the Jews in the original, authentic way. There's no permission to modify it. The reform modify it, not one of them left. They all become goyim. One, maximum two generations, they all assimilate, nothing left from them. They don't keep to the one mitzvah. Conservative are ten years behind them. And now modern Orthodox also on the way down. What's going to be our end? In the end, the Orthodox people will also fall down, and who's going to be left? What kept us as a nation is only the Torah. All the nations in the world had only one thing in their mind, to destroy the Jews. From day one until today, everywhere you go, it's the same thing. When the Jews are poor, when they're rich, when they're smart, when they're famous, when they're hiding, when they're in business, when they're not in business, when they're a lot, when they're very little, doesn't matter. There's always, they are the target of all the hate and the anti-Semitism everywhere. Why is it? One time I gave a ride to a rabbi. He told me on the way, drop me by the highway. So I told him, look what's going on. That was maybe 15 years ago. Everyone is after us. Today it's much worse than 15 years ago. So he told me, thank God. I was much younger than today. He said, thank God that everyone is after us. I said, why? He said, imagine if the whole world would be nice to us, you would not have 10 Jews left. Not 10 Jews would be left in the world if all the non-Jews, come Itzik, come Avi, join our family, we love you. Nobody would be left. Many people now, they're afraid. They say, I don't care about God. But I know if I marry someone from another nation, it's a jeopardy for my own life. Forget about religion. People are afraid. They don't know what to expect. If everyone would be nice, no anti-Semitism, no one speaks against the Jews, everyone love them and expect them, accept them, I doubt that if anyone would be left. As a protection for his children, God says in the Torah, you are my children. I chose you from all the nation. I gave you life of eternity if you only listen to me. The problem is you never do. As a result of that, I was forced to spread you in all the nation. And only few of you will survive because you did not follow your God with happiness. It's not enough to be religious. You have to be religious and to cry every day from joy from seven and a half billion people. I am the lucky one. Two million Jews in the world only keep Shabbat, the eternal covenant between Hashem and the Jewish nation. From 13.2 million Jews, only two million. That's it. The rest are going against Hashem, whether they know it, whether not, it's a different story. But only two million, that's it. They keep Shabbat. How many people learn Torah? Not even 200,000 in the whole world. From 7.5 billion people, 200,000 are connected to Hashem. Mm -hmm. Sometimes a person keeps Shabbat, but is not connected to Hashem. Because all day he is at war, he doesn't feel the Torah, the holiness, nothing. Where he lives, in his environment, he doesn't feel it. We are the only nation that our book can be proven with no doubt that is the book of God. Almost two billion Christians, every page of their book full of human errors in a level of kindergartens. You don't believe me? Watch my debate with a Christian professor. He leaves no doubt. Two billion people almost follow a book. It takes five minutes to prove for sure God never gave it. Quran, look how they die for this book. Look how much 
anger and how much threats we have in, life, in the world. Everyone in the world suffer because of this book, because of, because of the followers of this book. It takes five minutes, five maximum, to prove that this book never been given by God. And our book, the whole world tried to destroy it. Empires came to Jerusalem to destroy our temple. Jews are chased all over the world. 3,300 years, you go to Russia, you go to Yemen, you go to Iran, you go to Syria, you go to Germany, same Torah, 304,805 letters. You go to Saudi Arabia, you cross the border to Iran, different Quran. You cross the border to Iran, different Quran. You go to Kuwait, different Quran. Hundreds of different Korans. Where was the original one? No one knows. New Testament, 200,000 different books. Torah, one. Nobody chased New Testament to destroy them. Nobody chased Quran to destroy them. Nobody chased Buddhism to destroy them. Everyone chased the Jews to destroy them and the Torah, the Jews are here. The Torah is the same even though there was no communication. No telephone to compare, no printing, no internet, no nothing. The Jews gathered to Israel from all over the world, same Torah. All the empires disappeared from the world. Where are the Babylonians? Where are the Persians of Ahasuerus? Where are the Romans, the Greeks, the Philistines, Ashur? Where are they? Nothing left from them. The Jews that everyone after, the children of God, survive and they're all gone. Do you think it can be coincidence? It's not only against all art, it's something unheard of. Technically, we should have not be survived already 2,000 years ago from what we've been through. Why Hashem is so strict with us? That's a famous question. Why do the Jews have to suffer so much? <coughs> what did we gain by making a covenant with Hashem? Only problems it brings to us. Some people tell me. So my answer to them is, if a father walk at one o'clock at night in a park, and he see 10 guys, 18 years old, sitting there and smoke drugs, and one of them is his son, and that's the first time he finds out that his son is doing something he's not supposed to. I don't have to describe to you the horrible feeling in the heart. Even if the father himself doing it, he still feel horrible that his son also fell into it. So he runs to these guys, full of fire, and he comes to one of the kids and give him a huge smack to his face. And he begins to scream, run to the house! It's your end. Who did he hit from the ten people? Only his son. Maybe he cared about the others also a little bit. But it's the last concern he has right now. He only cares about his son right now. That's boiling. That's why Hashem smacking us nonstop. Wake up before you lose everything. You don't understand? Why do you think I put you here? Why do you think I give you 80, 80 years oxygen and money and hell to move, to talk, to think? Just to be a chimpanzee? All day, desires, desires, desires. That's what's on your life. Show off and food and and clothes, what's going on here? Almost no one in the world knows the purpose of life. How he will achieve happiness when he doesn't even know what's he, what is he living for? You ask him, tell me, can you tell me why the creator of the world gives you life? Why? For what? No, I don't know, to enjoy, to, to go on vacations, to be rich, uh, I don't know, to have children. Everything you say, the chimpanzee has for free doesn't have to kill himself to get it. So, it says like this. We have a problem today. Technology is very advanced. Companies inventing technology, believe it or not, they go from one model to another. Sometimes they do not publish the new model. They skip to the next one. Why? They develop so many things there's no time to market it, as already something new came out. They skip it. Technology, every day something new. 
Now, what is the problem with technology? It makes life a lot easier. What I can do with my phone in a day, I couldn't do in a year before the smartphone came out. Answering 500 emails, Facebook messages, posting things on Facebook every 15 minutes. We're an operation worldwide from a box that worth a few hundred dollars. So it's a very good gift. 71,000 people every 15 minutes, a new article, new video. And with the friends, it got to hundreds of millions of views every month. Without technology, if I lived a thousand years, I couldn't do it. What I do in an hour, a thousand years. So it's very good. But reality-wise, the same technology that can save so many souls also destroys souls. The free choice will always remain. But I want to ask you a question. Does it look normal to you that technology will determine the society values? What's supposed to control what? The values of our environment, our society should overcome technology and decide what's permitted and what not? Or technology will determine for us our new values? Which one of the two is correct? Which one? What's going on today? Everything that comes out, nobody begins to think it will destroy the world, it will destroy the children, so many millions will become drug addicts, people will get addicted to all kinds of forbidden things. Make a law against it. Free country. Everything is open. One time I spoke in a place, and one Israeli guy, he said, can I ask you a question? That was many years ago. Technology wasn't like today. You know, it was developing always, but not to the level it is now. So he said to me, you, the religious people, are so close-minded. You don't let your children choose anything. You choose everything for them. I don't want my children to be forced things on them. I want them to see the world and let them decide what they want to be, and I will respect it. They want to be religious, fine. They want to be secular, fine. They want to learn, good. They want to work, good. So I say to him, you never interfere with your son's choices? He said, no, that's what I'm telling you. I say to him, so I have an idea. He said, what? I said, let's go to downtown Manhattan. I will stand outside. You bring your six years old son. There's a gay club over there. Put your son inside all night to sit there on the bar and to see what they do. So he looks at me and says, are you crazy? I said to him, I don't understand. You just said that you're not limit your son for anything. You don't decide for him anything. You let him choose why this is no and this is yes. Because you don't have Torah. You don't even know who God is. You never read his book once in his life. If you would read his book and you see it's divine, and you would read what's recommended, what's not recommended, how to raise children, what to let them see, what not to let them see, then you will change completely the way you raise your children. But right now, you never read the Torah. So you're raising your children according to your understanding. I am not making your critical mistake. I don't guess and gamble on my children's life. I stick to the creator of the world who told me what kids should see and what they're not supposed to see. How you talk next to them. What you teach them, what you're not allowed to say next to them. How you get them dressed, what you teach them, what school, from what age, how you help them to get married, what you're supposed to give them, what you're not supposed to give them. Who has a better success, you or me? They didn't know what to answer. To talk, it's easy. But to be real is much, much harder. Time is running out. So you have to understand the value and the truth of our society based on the rules of God must be always above any development that happened in the world. Every new thing that comes out in science or in technology has to be checked and verified if it does not contradict the laws of God. If it passed the test, be my guest. Go ahead. That's why in Israel, they have internet, they have smartphone, kosher, with filters, with limitations. If a kid, if you give your kid a phone, 
You don't have to roll 50 times in bed where he is and what he watch. What the kids are watching today destroyed their mind. You have no idea what damage it does to their mind. How a person would reach happiness if by age 18 he already saw all the field in life. He saw all the most beautiful women in the world, all the dirty things in the world, everything in life, and one day he has to go on a date with a good, kosher, righteous, modest girl, and he's not attracted to her because he saw all the dirt and the filth on earth for so many years because his parents fed him with all this poison, and now they wonder why he's divorced three times. Or why, God forbid, he become a pedophile and all these sicknesses that we have in our society. Even religious people, it doesn't matter if they have a beard or yarmulke. If they follow the laws of the Torah, it's a protection. If not, what do you think? The beard is going to save you? The yarmulke, it's for, yarmulke is two dollars and the beard is for free. <laughs> <sighs> Let's conclude a few more minutes. Here, here we go. The Torah says, Shmor mitzvotai, observe my mitzvot, uchye, that you should live. Meaning, if you don't keep my mitzvot, you don't live? A secular Jew that doesn't keep mitzvot, he lives or he does not live? He also makes millions, no? He drives a nice car, he has a beautiful home, successful business. Everywhere in the Torah, this is what God said. If you follow my laws and follow my Torah, you will live. Which means, right now when you don't, you are not alive like you think. Where does it say it in the Tanakh that a person that is not connected to Hashem and doesn't keep Shabbat and mitzvot is spiritually dead? The verse is, Chai Hashem, I swear on my name, God says, I'm not interested to kill the dead. I'm interested that he will make sentence that he should live. Meaning, until he does it, he's in my eyes completely dead. Yeah, he makes millions. Yeah, he's the prime minister. Yeah, he's a judge in a court. Who cares? That's not impressed me. What does the Torah say? Who is God impressed by? Who? Mishamayim ishkif Hashem lirot ayesh maskil doresh el Hashem. Every day I search in the world to see who is an educated, successful person. Who? Not someone who went to Harvard or someone who went to Yale. No. That's what our society decided, that it deserves appreciation. But I don't give credit to all these educated people like they expect to get. By me, you only count if you educated in my truth and if you're righteous and if you overcome your desire, you don't behave like a monkey or like a dog. For that, you deserve appreciation. If you live like animals, follow your instincts, even a little desire right away you forget who you are, Every day is cheating and lying and deceiving and acting. Why do you think I appreciate this? Because you know how to remember books when you went to college. What is this? Only someone that searched for Hashem count as an educated person. Mishamayim, Hashem is viewing. Lirot ayesh maskil. In Israel they say you have to get a skala, you have to be educated. But the Torah says educated means Searching for Hashem. What is my purpose? Where I'm gonna end when I finish my life? Will I end in a good place or God forbid in the opposite side? So it says like this, when people died on their grave, what do we write? Te'e nishmato shel adoni tzrura betzror achayim. It's a verse in the Tanakh. The soul of this gentleman should be attached in the place of life. What life? Just died. The body died. The body is nothing. The body worth two dollars. Ask a chemist. Iron, minerals, salt, water, everything that makes the body, two dollars. Three dollars. If somebody dies, you sue for three dollars? 
many, many millions, right? Because everyone understands we're talking about a soul here. A soul. A dog die, you sue for $2,000. A man die, you sue for $100 million. Why? It's the same DNA. The monkey and the person, 99.7% same DNA. Same DNA. Monkey, $2,000. Three, five, ten. Human being, 50, 100, 500 million. Why? Everybody care about his hair and his beautiful eyes. <laughs> Where is all the brilliance of the human being? When Albert Einstein died, they searched his brain. What was special about him? If you take his brain and slice it and put it in a butcher shop in Israel, they, send cow, they sell cow brains. Before the mad cow disease in Israel used to be legal to sell brains. People used to buy it, 9.99 shekel, a kilo. If you take Albert Einstein brain and slice it and put 9.99 next to the cow brain, do you think one person will tell the difference? So how in this piece of meat all the physics and the knowledge enter right here? How? Where was it? Where is all the info? Where is all the conscious and subconscious and the memory and the decision and the love and the feelings and all the other things that we have? Where is it in the body? Only in a divine soul. Most of us, without realizing, are mentally sick. Not that we talk to ourselves. Not that we make faces on the street. No, no, no. No, no, we have beautiful tie. Nice fancy car, perfume, gel in the hair, everything, Baruch Hashem, beautiful earring, everything, $50,000, whatever. We, wow, I, I have a company, 3,000 employees, I'm, I'm, I'm mentally sick. The soul is sick, mentally. Ego, it's a sickness. Pride, anger, stinginess, jealousy. All these things is a mental disease. Hashem say to you, my friend, the only way to get cure is my Torah. No one can ever get cure without the Torah. Now one person in a history got rid of his anger without the Torah. Impossible. Now one person got rid of his ego without the Torah. I know people that used to be proud like a peacock, opening their feathers everywhere. One, two months in yeshiva, their ego went to zero. All the show off disappeared. Two months, Torah. The anger disappeared. The laziness disappeared. You come here later, you cannot recognize them. In one of my lectures, I see a guy full of tattoos, all his body scars in the face. I looked at him, I almost fainted from fear. Scar face. In real life. As soon as I finish the lecture, from all the people in the place, who ran to me? Him. <laughs> he comes to me, and you should see what the voice is. Oh, like I got goosebumps. I say, yes, how are you? And I say, who knows what he wants this guy? He said to me, do you know me? I say, no. You never read about me in Israel in the newspapers? I say, no, I, mean, I live here in America. He said, I used to be every week in a newspaper, Aolam Azeh. Do you know that newspaper or no? The Mafia newspaper. All the biggest criminals in Israel have special newspaper for them. That they develop who will kill who and who now controlling the drug market. Every week I was on the front page of Aolam Azeh. And then he began to tell me a story. He say to me, you see this guy over there? Show me another guy over there. He say, he wants now to come that you give him tzitzit to put. I'm warning you, in Hebrew, אני מזהיר אותך. Don't dare to give him tzitzit. So I say to him, why? It's good. The Jew wants to do tshuva. He say, no, no, I can't allow it. So I say, why? He say, you don't know us, but I want to tell you something. You see this truck? Show me a truck. In the end of the intersection, yes. I used to be the head of the drug market. I used to walk like this on the floor, smelling cocaine from here all the way to there. 
We used to rob boats in the middle of the ocean. The Interpol with helicopters were chasing us. We were shooting at them. I got arrested. I was in Italy. Gives me all these stories. I'm beginning to faint. <laughs> and then he came to the punchline. Mama, she, he's not even afraid that I'll turn him in. That I, right like that, he said to me, one time in Florida, we were hired to kill someone. We put the mask on the face. We have a map of the house where the bedroom is on the second floor. We go inside, we put spray, whole story. We walk inside with machine guns. We look for the bedroom. The father opened the door and he came out. And another boy came out. I was about to shoot, but when I saw the boy, I couldn't shoot. But this guy has no gun. He shot in front of the kid and he killed the man. You want to put tzitzit on this guy? I'm warning you. <laughs> what am I going to answer him? <laughs> I told him, what can I tell you? The Torah says even a guy like this can do tshuva. And in case you didn't know, according to the Torah, I did not write the Torah. I don't remember that Hashem called me to the board of heaven to consult with me before he gave the Ten Commandments. It never happened. But it says in the Torah that the punishment of Mechalel Shabbat is a bigger punishment than a murderer. That's what I told him. In the Torah, you don't have to believe me. Twelve times it's mentioned in the Torah. Go and read it. Don't believe me. Don't take my word for that. Read. Punishment of Mechalel Shabbat bigger. So he said, what? I say, yes. I shook him up. Believe it or not. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know how he didn't kill me. But he said to me, listen. If you park your car over here, you don't have to put coins in a quarter. Just put my name by the window. <laughs> <laughs> then he started to become Shomer Mitzvot, this gangster. This gangster Shomer Mitzvot, listen how good. I told him, he was asking me question, and I answered him, and question. Then Cholam Oet Sukkot, he came to my house in Monsi, all the Hasidim ran away! <laughs> As soon as he walked, with all his tattoos, sunglasses, like this, all the little Hasidish, shake it, shake it, go, <laughs> the Hasidim, he sits in my sukkah, it's, it's a neighborhood, his voice is so loud. I say, oh, that's the Nisayim Hashem gave me. What are you going to tell him, don't come? <laughs> so after all this, one day, I'm standing next to him, and he said to me, I have to make a phone call. So he called up the biggest gangster in Israel. This gangster, they put a bomb under his car in Tel Aviv a year ago, explode his car in the middle of Tel Aviv, if you follow the news. The head of the mafia, three brothers, he was the main brother. So he said to him, Yaakov, the $17,000 that you owe me, I don't want the money. Now the other guy doesn't know that this guy started to come to Shiure Torah and do tshuva. He thought, because it took so long from another robbery that they had, that he didn't pay him his share, so now he put a contract on him. So I hear the gangster on Israel that everyone is shaking from him on the phone. No, 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 give me until four o'clock, my brother will be there with the cash. I promise you, until four o'clock. <coughs> we said to him, no, I don't want the money. The guy said, no, I'm begging you. He said, listen, I became religious. It's dirty money. There's no blessing in it. So the other guy, what? <laughs> you became religious? <laughs> Believe it or not, the other guy was the head of the mafia, murderer, collecting protection from every business, and he was Shomer Shabbat. Wow. He's better than us. A murderer keeps Shabbat. And we're not going to keep Shabbat. Baruch Hashem, I don't think anyone here murders. <laughs> Look to me, all good people, Baruch Hashem. <laughs> people don't understand what Shabbat is. I get butchered on the internet for saying it, because nobody else dare to say the truth. <coughs> but don't get angry at me. I'm only telling you what the Torah says. What's better, that the doctor tell you the problem, or he hides it from you? You have to know. Shabbat in Mekor Abracha, it's the source of happiness, the source of blessing. 
You can make millions on Shabbat, you never have blessing in this money. No one ever was successful going against Hashem instruction. It cannot be. Nobody ever lost for overcoming his desire and listening to the Creator. It's not possible that you will agree not to go to work on Shabbat and give up the money and Hashem will punish you for that. When he told you that that's the most important thing in his eyes, that you're going to be Shomer Shabbat. What do you think? A son that gives his life for his father, the father will punish him for that? Show me one father like this in the world. So what, Hashem is worse than people? You're going to keep Shabbat, you're going to do Kiddush, you're going to sit with your wife and children and neighbors and friends and brothers and enjoy and talk and eat well and go to shul and meet family and friends and put the phone away and all the television and all the nonsense and finally you'll be a kosher Jew the way it should be and for that you're going to lose a penny? Who thought such a thing? It's completely against logic. By thinking like that, you're actually saying that Hashem, God forbid, is a monster. That is worse than any despicable murderer. That you're going to give your life for him and he's going to stab you in the back? I said, if a Hamas terrorist in Israel on the way to put a bomb somewhere and he had a flat tire and a Jew stopped <coughs> to help him out and he found out he's a Palestinian terrorist. And I, what can he do? He stopped already. So he helped him to change the flat tire. Do you think the Hamas terrorist will tell him thank you or no? Yes, he'll tell him thank you. And if he wanted to kill him, he won't kill him for that. And history already showed. Because you helped me, this time I'll let you go. Tomorrow maybe I will. But right now, he feels gratitude to him. What are you saying that Hashem is worse than this terrorist? That you're going to give your life for the truth and <coughs> fight with your desire and follow the path of the Torah, and Hashem in return will give you misery? How can it be? It's only come from one way, not learning, not understanding, not following all the miracles that Hashem does to you. I went now to pray, and a Sfaradi Minyan in Beverly is in Pico there, in the Chabad building, there's a Sfaradi Minyan, Rabbi Cordovero. He just told me an interesting story. What was the story? Rav Mordechai Eliyahu, Alav Shalom, was the chief rabbi of Israel. He went with his uh, assistant one time. He went to a place and he looked at the building and all the building was Christmas light, one Hanukkah menorah in a window. So he asked his assistant, what do you see in the building? He said to him, one Jew in the whole building. Rav Mordechai Eliyahu said, no, no, try to go deeper. He's thinking, he said, I don't know what. He said to him, imagine now there is a power outage. All these lights will go off. The only thing will remain is the Jewish menorah. So this assistant, he's thinking to himself, well, Mordechai Eliyahu doesn't talk for nothing. I wonder why he's telling me. Okay. 20 years later, Chabad invites Mordechai Mord Eliyahu somewhere in Europe, in Geneva, Switzerland there, to light the menorah in the center of a place. And when he arrived there, he needed to go on a special electric ladder because the menorah was so big, he cannot even reach. So he has a special truck, he picks you up. But around the whole circle over there, there were so many Christmas trees all over. So Rav Mordechai Eliyahu said to his assistant, how am I going to light this menorah surrounded by so much idol worshippings around me? How, how am I going to do such thing? What can he do? <laughs> Everyone is around looking. So, as he started to say, Radlik Ner Shul Hanukkah, Shasa Nisim Lavoteno Bayamim Maem Bazman Azeh Power Outage. All the Christmas trees, all the lights went off. Complete darkness. And the menorah lit. And he came down from this ladder and he said to him, remember what I told you 20 years ago? Imagine power outage. What's going to remain? The torch, the light of the Jewish nation will remain forever. All this show off, beautiful. The light of Judaism is the only one. And we have it. And sometimes we don't appreciate it. The last thing for today. Shimuli, Hashem says.
ואתה בנים, and now my children listen to me. ואשרי דרכי ישמורו, lucky are the one who follow my ways, כי מוצאי מצא חיים. Because someone who found me found life, but not life here. The dog is also alive here, without a shame. He doesn't read Tehilim and pray and learn Torah. Goyim, they don't learn Torah. Secular people, most of them also then don't learn Torah, but everyone is alive. No, no, no. That's what you call life. What I call life is only <laughs> life of eternity. The question is, are we going to be there? Or oh, God forbid, we're going to lose it. If we're going to follow, we will be happy here, and we will be happy forever over there. And in case you didn't know, the Torah say, if you take all the pleasure of all the people, of all the generation, anything you can imagine, money, vacations, glory, women, food, what sports, whatever you can think of, name it. Of all the people from the beginning of the world until the end of time, billions of people multiply by 70, 80 years of each person. It's billions and billions of years of pleasure will not be equal to the reward of one righteous Jew in the afterlife if he lived according to the Torah of God. Torah means instructions in Hebrew. That's what it means. You live by my instruction, you will be rewarded more than you can imagine. Where does it say it in the Torah? Yafa sha'a achat shil korat ruach ba'olam hazeh mikol chayi ha'olam haba. Yafa, the opposite. Yafa sha'a achat shil korat ruach ba'olam haba mikol chayi ha'olam hazeh. One hour in the next life is greater than this entire world combined when it comes to pleasure. The Gemara says, what are the righteous Jews are going to do in the next world? The answer, Yoshvim Tzadikim, Ve'atrotem Le'roshehem, Ve'nehenim Iziv Ashkina. The righteous people have a special crown to their heads. And enjoy the greatness of God. What is it? We cannot understand in this world because there's no way to describe it. The Gemara said, the Chachamim asked, the Gemara speaks about all the punishments of the wicked people in the afterlife, everything. For every sin, what the person gave, everything. But when it comes to the reward, few sentences. That's it. Why? You have to balance. Make 50-50. On the reward, few words. Punishment, <coughs> chapters. What's going on? The answer, trying to explain a person in this world, the divine reward is like trying to explain a blind person the color blue. Someone who was born blind, he never saw color. He said to him, Itzik, do you see what a beautiful blue color the ocean is? What's blue? It's close to green. What's green? It's like the sky. What's the sky? It's very relaxing. What's relaxing? He doesn't have it in his computer. He has no idea what you're talking about. There's no way to explain to a person who never saw color, any color. You open his eyes for one second, you show it to him, he understands. The answer is to explain a person that his soul is inside a material body. Half animal, half God half divine, half animal. To explain to him the, the spiritual divine reward, it's not possible. But one thing we do know, when God say, everyone will enjoy my greatness, what can go wrong? He's not a member in the Israeli Knesset or in the Congress. Over there you get a lot of promises and everyone follow them. And in the end, major disappointment. One politician, he got elected, and one day he died. So Hashem said to him, listen, I have a problem. On one hand, you are not religious, but on the other hand, half of the country vote for you. So I don't know what to do with you. So listen, I'm going to show you Gehenom, and I show you heaven, and you tell me where you want to go. 
So the guy said, fair deal, God, fair, fair deal. So he took him to Geno, he see jet ski, rock and roll players, bar, shows, people, everyone dressed nice, everyone cocktail, bars, our dancers, beautiful, wow, what a nice place. This is Geno? Shem say yes. So okay, show me, uh, show me Ganet and show me heaven. They take him to another and you see thousands of Jews with Gmarot open, like this. Ah, Shnaim Ochazim Betalit, so Oh, I'm allergic. Maya, Maya, take me back there, Maya, to the jet ski. Before, he said to him, you sure? You made up your mind? You sure you want to go back to the other side? Say, yeah, yeah, quick, quick. Don't wait another minute. All my life I was running away from this kind of people. Take me over there. He begin to cry. Hey, no problem. Open the door. They open the door. He comes inside. There's him. Everyone like this crying. Shrink like this. It's horrible, depressing place. Well, wait a minute. It's not the place. He said, that was before the election. Now it's after the election. <laughs> Everything you promised your people before was beautiful. As soon as you got elected, you don't even answer the phone. But Hashem is not like that. You can relax. Ani Eli met I'm the God of justice, who gives everyone exactly what they deserve. Some people say, I don't believe for one reason. Rabbi, I don't believe you with all the respect. We see wicked people celebrate, and we see righteous people suffer. There's no justice. No justice, I cannot rely on God. I'm sorry. Fair or not fair? What do you think? Good question or not? Is this a legitimate question or no? It's a very not legitimate question for one reason. If every time a person will do something good, right away the reward will be served to him. And everyone who violates the rules of the Torah right away gets a punch. Do you know one person that would ever make a scene? Even Arafat would write checks to the yeshiva. <laughs> what do you do, Yasser? I don't know. Last time I wrote a million, I got two million an hour later. Very good business. Everyone who lights a cigarette on Shabbat. Psh, explosion. His friend, accident. Psh, explosion. After two people explode, lighting fire on Shabbat, what's the third one will do? Shabbat comes, he goes like this. His wife, Moshe! Shh! Shabbat started. Come, I need your help! Shh! I don't want to move. By mistake, I touch the fire, the electric. What's going on? Of course, everyone would be religious if the punishment would be immediately. So Hashem say, the reward and the punishment eventually will all be balanced to exactly what you deserve. But of course, not instant. Everyone will get right away. That's no free choice. The test will be eliminated before it even started. What? No one will do from fear. Fear, it's not good. You need also love. But you have to trust God that is not a liar. And all of us know that God is not a liar. We know it. We don't need a rabbi to convince us that Hashem is not a politician. And it's not politically correct. That's also a problem. It doesn't tell you what you want to hear. It tells you what the truth is. It says like this. Aboteach <coughs> Hashem, someone that trusts Hashem, Yesugav Minatzara, will be saved from the problem because of his trust in Hashem. Many of us, unfortunately, are sick. When, when people ask us, how did you get this disease? We answer, how am I supposed to know? Bad luck. One day I got up, I had pain, I went to the doctor, he told me you have it. How many people in the world connects between what happened to them, to their health, to their financial situation, to their marriage, to their misery? to the choices that they make in their life. Very, very few people. Not only most people do not connect from problems that they have in life to the way they behave, when someone dare to tell him, do you know why you're sick? 
because it's written in the Torah that someone that doesn't listen to me, I'm gonna be very upset with him, and I'll punish him with this. The same way I am the one who sends the sicknesses, I am the one who can take it away. The doctors are important, but they cannot move an inch without me. I am the final decision maker. The doctor wants to save you, give his life. I don't want you to live, you won't live. I want you to be sick, you stay sick. But I'm not, it's not Russian roulette that I pick up numbers and people get it, like some people think. No, no. Where does it say it? Here it is. It says like this, you, you follow your Hashem, your God, He will bless your food and bless your water. And I will remove the sicknesses from among you. Because I am your God, your doctor. Doctor deserves appreciation. Doctor deserves a gift if he saves your life. But who did everything? 99.999% Hashem. Hashem, Hashem. And Hashem doesn't just choose for nothing. We have to know the smart person is returning back to Hashem and fulfill his mission in life before problems begin. Not after. In Israel they have a say, what happened? Someone died? Why you became religious? <laughs> Business went down? You went bankrupt? Tell me, talk to me, I'm your friend. Why? There is some kind of understanding that only miserable people become religious. <coughs> Come on. You have to be a little bit more serious than that. It says like this. Oi! Oi! Aumrim laratov. Oi to those who call bad good. Samim choshech leor, they call the light darkness. Veor la choshech, and call the darkness light. Call the sweet bitter, and the bitter sweet. Those who leave my ways, the honest ways, and replace them with ways of darkness. The Ramchal, Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutzato, one of the greatest legendary Kabbalists in the history that wrote more than a hundred books in a short life that he lived, 38 years, almost all of them were gone. Only few are left. One of the most important books in Judaism, Pat to the Just. I brought you three CDs here. Some of them, I made a whole series about the book. It changed the life of non-Jews. As soon as they hear it, it changed their entire approach about life. The entire views, everything changed when they realized how, low, how mistaken they were. The Ramchal asked, he said there are two kinds of people that live in the darkness. This guy lives in the darkness, and this guy lives in the darkness, spiritual darkness. So why does he call them two kinds of people? Reuven lives in the darkness, Shimon lives in the darkness, both of them in the same darkness. So why does the Ramchal distinguish between them? The answer, the answer, one just found out that he's in the darkness. He came to a lecture or he got a DVD or CD. He realized all my life is one big bluff. Now, two friends going to play golf. Two rich friends. They take their Bentley convertible, <coughs> sit in a half a million dollar car with their cigars, with their golf equipment, on the way to the country club. One, panim tisha be'av. One is face, tisha be'av. Like this. The other one, singing, enjoying life. Technically, when you look at them, who looks more miserable and who looks more, who looks happier? The one that's singing looks very happy. The other one looks very miserable. The only problem is that both of them are very sick. They're both very sick. The one with the Tisha Be'a face just found out early today that his results came bad and he's gonna need a horrible treatment and maybe he would leave and maybe not. Happens every day, unfortunately. 
He found out that he has it, and the other one does not know that he has it. Who is more miserable right now? Who is in a better condition? The one that's crying and is not in the mood for the golf game? Or the other one, life is great, making millions, money come from all over. Shh. <laughs> huh? Who? No? You ask everybody, I want to be this guy. This guy is in a better condition. Why? He just found out he's sick. He has a chance to get saved. The other one has no chance to get saved. Sometimes a secular person, all his life is one mistake after the other. Not one minute of his life he follows his mission. Nothing. And he's singing and happy. Every day, <laughs> you know, wow. And the other one, psh, horrible. But the other one can save his situation. This one is just a matter of time. Uven told Shimon, I want you to do me a favor. Here is a bag, it's very heavy. I know today it's very hot and humid. I need you to climb all the way on the mountain over there and give it to Yosef. It's going to be a great favor for me. Shimon is a nice guy. He likes Ruven. He agreed. He took the bag on his back and he begins to climb. Another rock, another rock, another rock. After 10 minutes, he can't breathe. He puts the bag on the floor. He sits on a rock and he begins to curse the day he was born. Oh, what a fool I am. Why I always agree. Why I didn't think about this. Now his wife, bad timing, life is all about timing. She calls him right now. Shimon! <laughs> oh, you again, Hashem Yerachem. Don't call me in the middle of the night! <laughs> his wife said, wow, who knows what happened? She opened the tailing. She said, oh, <laughs> my husband lost money. <laughs> then this guy, Ruben, is watching him the entire time and smile. <laughs> Look at him. Then uh, he felt bad for him. He calls him up. Shimon, oh no, it's you again. Do you want something else? He said, you know, I forgot to tell you something very important. This bag is full of diamonds. Full of diamonds. When you reach the top of the mountain, this guy also will search. He will take three diamonds from the bag. And all the hundreds of diamonds are your reward for your effort. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't tell you that before. Hang up. Now what happened to this guy, Shimon? He got up, takes the bag. <laughs> <laughs> no sweat, no nothing. Oh, his wife said, Shimon, I'm sorry, I'm calling. It's important. Hi, honey. It's been a while. Why are you not calling me a lot? What happened? No, no, don't worry. It was the wrong number. It wasn't me. It's very happy. What happened now? The heat is the same heat. The humidity, same humidity. The weight of the bag, same weight. <coughs> same distance. Same everything. Only one switch was open in a mind. I'm not working for free. Nothing is difficult. I have an uncle. He has a very big restaurant. And Baruch Hashem is a good man and very, very wealthy man. When I was a kid, we used to go there in a summer vacation. And he was working with all the Arabs, cleaning the, pot, the pots and the pans in the restaurant. Mustafa, Ahmed, Ibrahim, and my uncle. So, so I said to my father, why is he working with all the workers? He's the boss. So my father said, he enjoyed to see all the money coming into the register. When he see all day money comes in, he doesn't care to clean pen and put some oil. But when you work for someone else, every day of your life is suffering. But all the money comes to you, you care. Ah, delicious. That's what's going on here. Most of the people that do not want to be religious because they think, what am I going to get from it? The answer, you're going to get happiness. You're going to get peace of mind. You're going to have discipline. You're going to have a better marriage. You're going to have better children. 
you will have less addictions, less stress, less problems, no jealousy, no fear. You will never fear the future. You have a father who watch over you. You have a peace of mind. You have a lot of, a lot of knowledge who will revive your soul. And the most important thing, life of eternity. Eternity means billions and billions and billions of years of pleasure. It's not even the beginning, or oh, God forbid, to lose it for driving the car on Shabbat to the supermarket to buy macaroni. <laughs> the Torah says, Do not dare to light fire anywhere you'll be. Not allowed. Not the car, not electric. One guy told me, Rabbi, electric I don't light on Shabbat. But lights, it's not electric. They didn't have it in the time of the Torah. I say, let's make a deal. Hold the light bulb 10 seconds. If you go on fire, I'm right. If not, you're right, you won. 10 seconds, you go all over you on fire with your house. People don't know. You know, I think Shabbat is a joke. If a person has a house, worth 100 million dollars. And inside he has furniture for another 100 million dollars. Picasso pictures, statues, all kinds of things. Plus he has another 100 million dollars in cash, hidden in a basement. 300 million dollars. And God forbid the house goes on fire. People ran out, no life risk. What's the deal? Let me put the fire off. Psh, psh, psh. Finish. $300 million got saved. Not allowed. Shabbat is above billions. Shabbat is above life. People think life is more important than Shabbat. They don't know it. The only reason we are allowed to violate Shabbat to save the life of another person, the Gemara say, because it would keep many more Shabbatot to come. Otherwise, we would not have permission to violate Shabbat even to save the life of our brother. Do you know what Shabbat is? You think it's a joke? Oti beniu venechem, v'shamru b'nei Yisrael et ha-Shabbat, and the nation of Israel observed the Sabbath, la'asot et ha-Shabbat ne'dorotam brit olam, to make Shabbat an eternal covenant beniu ven b'nei Yisrael, between me and the nation of Israel. It's a sign for eternity that I created the world in six days and seven days I rested. I want to make you like me. I am God. I made the world in six days. You are my son. You have to tell the world. Six days you can create. Shabbat you're not allowed to create. I am a little God. He's a little God. She's a little God. Everyone here is a little God. Why? Banim atem la'ashem elokechem. Kedoshim tiyu ki kadosh ani. You should be holy because I'm holy. I chose you from all the nations. No one is like you. The Torah say, the Gentiles believe in the Torah, Muslim, Christians, they're not denying that the Jews got the Torah from Hashem. And what does the Torah say? And goim kamar midli ukeshachak moznaim nechshavu. Hashem say to the Jews, all your life you busy to imitate the Gentiles. You dress like them, you talk like them, you copy their names, everything. And later you marry them and you get destroyed. But let's think for a second. I wrote to you in the Torah. Do you know what's the difference between you and the rest of the people in the world? Once I chose you and I made a covenant with your father, Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, you're not what you used to be. You're not a regular Gentile anymore. You are a special VIP children of God. You cannot behave like a shoe shine on the street. You can't. You're a prince. Every prince represents the king. You can't walk on the street naked. You can't walk on the street with high heels and mini skirt like this, like an oyster that everyone looks at your legs. What's going on here? You represent God. What do you think? It's a joke? So the Torah say, and goim kamar midli ukeshachak moznaim nechshavu. The Jews, for me, when you bring water from the ocean or from the lake, you put it in a bath, you throw the bucket. There are a few drops there. You, my children, are the water 
and they are the few drops in a bucket. What do you want to be? You want to be the water or you want to be the drops? When you go to the market, you put one weight on one side, thousand kilo, and one on the other side, you put cucumbers or tomatoes. If you take the weight, it's supposed to be a thousand grams. You put it on an electronic scale, it's never a thousand grams. Over the years, it shaved off. The corners became round. Then the 1,000 gram is 999. 998. Nobody cares about the one or two grams that went to the garbage. It's a verse in the Tanakh that the Goim admit. If the Goim would challenge the Torah, okay, it's our world against the world. What they teach in the school that the Jews got the Torah on Mount Sinai and they believe in all the prophets, include the Hamas and the Hezbollah believe in all the prophets, go to the Hamas website, check. King David, peace be on him. Israel, peace be on him. Abraham, peace be on him. They're not denying. So when they read in the Torah, you the Jew is the weight, and, and they are the little crumbs who fell off to the garbage. You compare yourself to them and you want to imitate them. They have the privilege to convert to be you. How can you go and want to be like them when I chose you and I gave you eternity of pleasure? You, the nation of the book. Who called the Jews the nation of the book? Who invented this term? Muhammad. Muhammad called the Jews the nation of the books. The Quran say the Torah is holier than the Quran. It's in the Quran. If you have a doubt in the Quran, go to the Jews and ask them before they receive the Torah before you. It's a verse in the Quran. But the Jews don't want to listen. And that's why most of us are not happy. And we said, and God forbid we would lose everything in the end because we want to live in a continual illusion and lies. And it's very, very sad. That's the only reason I, ra I ran from one country to another. Today I'm here. Next Thursday I'm in Belgium. Monday I'm in Israel. I come back, I go to Montreal, Miami, Dallas, Chile. Argentina, no life, no nothing. Just to wake up, Jews to wake up. Baruch Hashem, thousands woke up. It's not enough. What about all the others? As long as we're alive, we can correct. Once we passed away, we miss the train. Anyone who has a doubt if the Torah is divine, I respect you 100%. All you have to do is to watch my film over there, Torah and Science. I promise you, you won't have doubts after that. Watch it. It leaves no doubt. It proves you that the Torah cannot be written by a human being, only the creator of the world. Once you know the Torah is the book of God, it's much, much easier to follow. Then it's only a matter of belief or faith. Any questions before we finish? Baruch Hashem, everyone is in shock. Very good. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, 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 okay, okay. Louder, please. Louder, louder, yes. I said I was a little surprised to hear you say whatever comes is for your own good uh, because I thought the Rambam and the guy rejects that uh, ideology. I was hoping you could elaborate on that a little more. Everything that happened to the person, the Gemara say, Rabbi Akiva say, Kol man de'avid rachmana latavavi. Everything Hashem does, that's for the sake of the person. However, this is the trick here. If a person gets an open heart surgery, that they cut his chest, is in a hospital, six months he cannot work, his business go bankrupt, and he loses all his life saving. How can something like this be good for him? The answer is, in the moment that Rosh Hashanah came, which is the judgment day, that Hashem had to decide what to do with this person because of his sin, then Hashem say that the only way that this person will wake up to do tshuva, to take away all his ego and all his money, make him helpless, that he'll begin to think about life. And history already showed that people that lost all their money, they finally had time to search for Hashem. Now, you're right. If the person would not make any sins, 
he didn't have to learn in a hard way. It would be a lot better. But after he made so many scenes, he actually forced Hashem to teach him the hard way. That's exactly like in the Israeli army. When you join the Israeli army, you knew, you don't know. So the commander say, you have 60 seconds to go to the mountain, bring me a leaf from the tree and come back. <laughs> Not all the soldiers running. Some people walk like this. Eh, they, they don't understand yet what the army is. So after the, off the general see that this guy is pretending that he's running, he said to him, you, you come here. Now you're gonna run all night, back and forth, until four in the morning, all night. And that's what they say in the Israeli army. What doesn't come through the head, come through the legs. <laughs> With the head, one minute, you get the point. A little bit efforts, and you dismiss. You don't want to learn in an easy way? You learn the hard way. All night! I'm talking from experience. <laughs> Mizrahi! We'll teach you now what it means to be a good soldier. You ready? My shoes, blisters, all my skin's peel, horrible pain, have mercy. <laughs> run, run, you're making too much noise. <laughs> you understand? But Hashem is not like that. He's not sarcastic and he's not making fun at us. But he judges us fairly. Hashem cannot do whatever he wants. Remember, he made a system with rules. He cannot go against his rules. If I'm the judge in the Supreme Court and I pass a law that everyone will drive faster than 100 miles an hour, immediately get arrested for 30 days. And tomorrow they bring my brother, drove 110 miles and I have to judge him. What am I gonna do? Oh, Shimon, I oh, it's okay. <laughs> it was 90, it wasn't 110. The radar was broken. I cannot be a judge after that. Everyone would say, hey, this is a judge. It's not a fair judge. When Hashem made rules, the Satan scream objection in Rosh Hashanah. Why you want to give this person what you want to give him? How are you letting him, letting him go? It's not fair. So Hashem is a problem. He has to find a way around it. What's the solution? I give you a tip. You want to make millions of mitzvot? In a much easier way? You have to learn how to invest charity in a correct way. Many charities are important. You give to the poor, you give to the sick, you give to the widow, you give to the shul. It's, very, it's, it's all mitzvot. But there are levels. Not every charity brings the same income. There's one charity is by far better than anything. What is it? What's the greatest investment? Very good. You see right there on the table. It's CD one dollar, 30 hours of lecture. People sponsor it. I don't pay for it from my pocket. People pay, send money on a website, on a credit card. They buy information.com, charge the car. We make CDs. I bring them. I take them here, take them there. We brought thousands with us on this trip here. Full suitcases. Why? People begin to listen right away. They're starting to change more and more and more, and they give it to another one, and they go into the website, and they download the app, and they connect it to Torah. Three months later, he's a rabbi. He's a whole new person. <laughs> Who gets all the mitzvot that he does? The person that sponsored the one dollar CD. Every mitzvah he will do, and his children, and his grandchildren, and grand, grand, grandchildren for eternity, billions of mitzvot go to the sponsor. That's what the Torah say. Gadola me'aseh, yoter minaoseh. Someone who makes others do mitzvot, his reward is even bigger than them. They do all the hard job, and he gets more reward than them. Why? Hashem wanted to encourage Jews to save another, one another. We have over here, we have Eliran, we have Shlomit, we have Rabbi Louis, that is in Eretz Israel. They ran, they sent emails, they, so they did a lot of things. They made flyers, they arranged the place. It's a lot of work. But it's worth it. The amount of work compared to the profit, it's a joke. Even if you work a month straight, it's enough that one Jew here tonight will become Shomer Shabbat. And then his children, and grandchildren, and grand-grandchildren, and he will convince others. And he himself will donate. And we make more CDs, and we give them to others, all goes to their account. It's worth it for a few emails and a few phone calls and running around a little bit. 
That's what people don't get. To make others do mitzvot is the greatest investment. And I have hundreds of stories, but we don't have time. More questions before we finish? Right here, yes? Um, just like the rabbi said about the story with the father and, and his son in the park when he was doing drugs. Yes. So he gets a slap. Yes. So, looks like the Messiah Shaim says, I think that we're here to get um, pleasure from Hashem Shekhina. But it doesn't look like that because the majority of the people in this whole world are, are souls that are in baby in suffer. And we're only 200,000 people with Shema Shabbat. So how are these, why is there only 200,000 people who are going to be getting the Shema uh, Shabbat? 2 million Shema Shabbat, 200,000 learning yeshivot. Yeah, okay. Same we still have 11 more million Jews to save. Okay. I, I want to tell you one thing, look, I'm doing it, right? We have over here a lot of people. If everyone will accept on himself to make one Jew religious, every one of the two million religious Jews will make one religious. In one month, we will be four million. And then everyone will make another one. In two months, we'll make everyone religious. And the one who would not become religious, at least we tried. Now we know, we got to the top. Whoever could become, became. And the rest will never become, end of story. But the problem is there's only a few individuals who run around and do it. But other people can do it as well, with their money, with their time, with their electronic skills, with their Facebook pages. <coughs> What's the big deal to share? I never understand that. I have thousands of people who are reading every post. 1,000, 35,000, 37,000, 80,000, 100. One post I had, 1,030,000 views. One post. And I'm looking to myself, I say, not even 1% of the people press share it. <laughs> How much it costs to press share? You have 300 people on your page. You just saw beautiful proof that the Torah is divine. You love it very much. Why being selfish? Why don't click share that 300 other Jews, maybe one of them has a great soul, it's enough for him. He will watch it and say, whoa, I didn't know the Torah is divine. Who is this speaker? Right away, oh. There's thousands of YouTube emails for me. You begin to listen. A month later, he's in yeshiva. You click share, cost you nothing. You save a soul for eternity. But people don't want us to do it. I don't know why. Why? Because the reward is so much, the Satan is fighting. To save other souls, it's not easy. Because the Satan is fighting, because the reward is huge. More questions? Yeah. So if I understood you correctly, you basically said, that the reason why the person who had an open heart surgery had this misfortune is because he did something wrong in the past. Uh, but again, if I remember correctly, the Ramah gives an example and he says, well, look, that are, it would be unfair to say, for instance, someone who's born blind did something wrong, or an animal who's shakita did something wrong. So how would you address that? No, first of all, we have a very simple rule in Judaism. The Gemara in Masechet Megillah, page 12, the Gemara say, Everything is measure for measure. Whatever happens to us good is as a result of something similar good that we did. Whatever happened bad is results of something bad that we did. Therefore, if a baby is born before he made one scene in his life, already blind, or have a birth defect, he did not make any scene. But the Torah said, any surim belochet, no suffering unless there was a prior scene before. So now where this baby exactly made the scene, you go to the Ariya Kadosh, Shara Gilgulim, Kabbalah, explain all the concept of reincarnation. And it explains all of us, people with defect, people blind, people normal, everyone is a reincarnation that was in a previous life and he came to this world to correct. The difference is like this, you and I, are normal with free choice, Baruch Hashem, no defect, no brain damage, no blind, no nothing. So we're still in a test right now. We choose to do good, to do bad, and in the end we'll be judged. People that come with brain damage or things like that, sometimes they are here for a very short period of time, they have only one thing to correct. Everything else was fine, which means they're very, very close to heaven, closer than us. We look bad at them and poor people, we feel bad for them. In reality, they are very, very close to the place in heaven. No one ever got something from Hashem, good or bad, because of his beautiful eyes. 
Everything is mida keneged mida. I did not write the Torah. It's clear in the Torah. Measure for measure. No one can contradict it. Also, the concept of reincarnations is already been proven scientifically. I brought you right here a DVD, Life After Death. If none are left, go into my website. It's free. Put Life After Life. You get it. I show you millions of people who came back, died, who came back to life, and their soul came out of their body. I show over there people who in their life remember their previous life with names and details where they used to live. I show you people that hypnot were hypnotized and speak in different languages that they don't know. You ask them, where are you? 1920, before he was born. A woman speak in the voice of a man, men speak in the voice of a woman. They describe their previous life like it's in the present. Plus, I put in my Facebook page in Hebrew a month ago, a kid, autistic kid, with Down syndrome, that his family is all secular Israelis, and they begin to communicate him with a the computer, they type, and they ask him, why you came to the world like this? And he say, because I used to say things that I'm not allowed to say in my previous life. So they asked him, they filmed the whole thing. If you understand Hebrew, you can see it on my Facebook page. Scroll down a month back. Maybe I'm going to repost it this week if I have time. They asked him, what did you say? He said, I spoke very bad things. And they asked him, what bad things you spoke? He said, I spoke very bad Lashon Ara about people. And as a result of that, I came to the world like this. And he made his entire family Shomer Shabbat. For after they realized what he went through in his trial, in his previous life, and how he came to the world, people get angry, they get upset. What are you getting angry for? Anybody came here to talk to offend you? Anyone has any reason to upset you? Anyone has any reason to make you upset, Chaz Shalom, if you have such a kid? The opposite. We want to make you understand how the world works. It's all in the Torah. The speakers that speaks about it, they didn't write the Torah. Everything I ever spoke about, now one time I brought it up from my own opinion. It's all either in the Ariya Kadosh, in the Gemara, in the Zohar, in the Rambam, in the Torah, in the Navi. Everything has a source. The speakers in general don't sit and make up ideas. It doesn't work this way. We're not talking about politics here or sport that this is your opinion, how the team should be. We're only talking what Judaism taught us. Yes, there are some areas that there's disagreement and arguments. For instance, there's a famous rabbi, Rav Saad Yagaon, who lived more than a thousand years ago. His understanding was that there is no reincarnations. Why? Because he didn't have the Zohar. The Rambam also didn't have the Zohar. The Zohar was published in the last years of Rambam's life, after the Rambam already finished his life, that's when the Zohar was discovered in the world. Rav Saad Yagam was 300 years before anyone knew about the Zohar. The Zohar was hidden for 1,300 years from the time of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. No one knew about it. There was no internet, no telephone, no fax to communicate. Many rabbis live in different parts of the world. No, no communication. The rabbis only know what they learn in yeshiva. If no one had the Zohar, without the Zohar, we'd never know about the concept of reincarnations. We would not know. The Ariya Kadosh, 500 years ago, the greatest Kabbalist in the history, wrote a whole chapter. Who comes back in what form of reincarnation as results of what sin? Sometimes people come back as animals. Sometimes people come back as raw material. Sometimes people come back as plants. Sometimes people come back as defected with all kinds of problems. And sometimes they come back normal with free choice that they have another chance to choose the right way to live before, God forbid, they miss the train. Everything is written. Not me and not all the other speaker who ever spoke about it ever made it up. It's all written. You can go to the Shara Gilgulim of the Ariya Kadosh. It describes all the reincarnations. You can see it in the Zohar. And Chazal in Gemara speaking about measure for measure. The punishments are not random. It's all as results of something. 
when my soul was in a different body, I probably did something wrong. Now I came back to the world, I have to correct what I did wrong. What's wrong with that? That's the purpose of life. You like it, fine. You don't like it, too bad. What can I do? You can go against Hashem? Well, if you can demonstrate, stand out here in the parking lot, Hashem, I disagree with you. <laughs> go to the Western Wall, write a note, complain to Hashem, what do you want from me? I want to thank you very much for coming. We'll see you again.